Okay, uh, where we're picking up in Mark chapter three, if you missed last week to kind of catch you up, Jesus uh, dropped a, a, a pretty hardcore bomb on the religious Pharisees. It was a beautiful thing, like one of the greatest promises in scripture, followed by one of the greatest warnings. He basically said, anyone's sins can be forgiven, which is so amazing. The gospel and forgiveness is for everybody. But he said, but if you blaspheme the Holy Spirit, which essentially is rejecting the way of forgiveness, he says, then, then you can't be. If you, if, if you don't want want forgiveness, there's no way for you to be forgiven. But ultimately, in that, that statement, he's saying, like, anybody who comes to me can be forgiven. And in that context, talking about anybody can be brought into the family of God, we see following that passage a story actually about family. And Mark, the writer of Mark, is very intentional in pairing this next story with what we talked about last week to show how anybody can become a part of the family of God. And so we see a story here starting in chapter 3, verse 31, if you want to look down, it says this, and his mother and his brothers came and standing outside, they sent to him and called him and a crowd was sitting around him. And they said to him, that is, they said to Jesus, your mother and your brothers are outside seeking you. And he answered them, who are my mother and my brothers? And looking about at those who sat around him, he said, here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and my sister and my mother. So what's going on here? Jesus is in the midst of a crowd and he's teaching a crowd as is a custom in his ministry. And all of a sudden word is brought to Jesus in the middle of this teaching that, hey, Jesus, your, your family's outside. Your mother's here and your brother's here and they want to see you. Now, most people would expect that Jesus would get up and would go and greet his family because in the Jewish tradition, they had a lot stronger family values than we do here in the Western culture. And if your family just traveled a couple of miles to come and see you, the most like respectable thing that you could do is to just get up and at least go greet them and welcome them in and then continue. But even deeper, Jesus is a Jewish rabbi. Jesus is familiar with the Old Testament and with the law and what the scripture says. And so Jesus would have no doubt known the saying, which is to honor your father and mother. And again, one of the greatest ways you could just honor your mother is if she comes to just kind of prioritize her needs to get up and to go and greet her. But we see that Jesus actually didn't do that. Jesus doesn't stop what he's doing as he's talking to the crowds to go and to greet his family and to go and greet his mom. He doesn't do that. Instead, they say, hey, Jesus, your mother and your brothers are here. And Jesus looks out at this crowd of all these strangers who are sitting there around him and he asks them a question. And that question is, who are my mother and my brothers? Now, when Jesus asks that question, I can only imagine there had to have been a really awkward, long, drawn out silence. You know, that type of lock, uh, awkward silence that you got back in the day in class when your teacher asked a question and nobody really knows the answer, but it almost seems so obvious. He's like, who's my mother and brother? And someone wants to go, them standing around outside, but like, it's that awkward silence. I was always the kid who filled that silence with just a crazy answer because I was like, I can't handle this anymore. And so um, I, I can imagine that's the scene here. That's what's going on. So he says, who is my mother and brothers? And then there's this long, awkward silence. Nobody in the crowd apparently was like me when I was in high school. Nobody shouts something random out. And so Jesus actually answers that question himself. Jesus looks around at all those strangers who are sitting there and what what he says is this. He says, here are my mother and my brothers. Pointing to the crowd, pointing to all these strangers. Here are my mother and my brothers. And then he says in verse 35, whoever does the will of God is my brother and my sister and my mother. So Jesus answers the question for himself. And he says, my mother, my brother, and my sisters are you guys are those who are here, anyone who does the will of God. Now, what's Jesus saying here? What's, what's the point of this whole story of ignoring his mom and saying, you're my mom and you're my brothers and you're my sisters if you do my will? What's the big idea here that Mark's trying to get across? Well, for a moment here, before we dive fully into what Jesus is talking about and the big concept, I did wanna for a moment just real briefly mention 
what he is not talking about and what he doesn't mean because some people have interpreted this passage in a completely wrong way and I've actually heard this passage taught before that what Jesus is saying that once you actually come to Jesus and follow Jesus, your biological family is no longer important because it would kind of appear that way like Jesus is ignoring his true biological mom and his brothers and some, so some people have, have actually said that once you come to Jesus, you don't really have to worry about or care about or like, like do anything for your physical, biological family. All that matters is that now you're following Jesus and your primary allegiance is to him. Well, we know that that's not Jesus's intent and that's not Jesus's heart because when Jesus was actually hanging on the cross, we see in John chapter 19, one of the final things Jesus did before he died was make sure that his mom was gonna be taken care of. We see this in John 19, verse 26 and 27. It says this, and Jesus is here on the cross and it says, when Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her to his home. And so Jesus has a high value of family. Jesus, before he died, made sure that John, the apostle of love, was going to now take care of his mom and provide for her. So Jesus, in doing this, the point of the passage isn't Jesus doesn't care about his biological family. Sadly, I've seen in ministry over the years, I've been, I think, in full-time ministry now 12 years, I've seen so many pastors and so many people in ministry who have lost their marriages because they have neglected their family and they've chosen to say, oh, well, I'm just following Jesus. I'm just doing ministry and so I'm so busy, kind of like Jesus was here. People have used this passage as a way to justify neglecting the family that God has placed in their life and that's not the point of this passage and that's actually not healthy. The earthly family that God has placed you in, your parents, your brothers, your sisters, your husband and your wife, family Family is your most important ministry. And if somebody idolizes ministry above family, then it's gonna fall apart. And I've seen it so many times and the enemy tries to do that. And I can honestly say, like I experienced seasons of that when we planted the church with how busy I was and how much was going on that I was burning out and burning out because I wasn't prioritizing time with my wife. And I, I had to put those safeguards in place. And luckily we're in a lot better um, space right now. But Jesus here in doing this, he's not saying your family doesn't matter. Your family's unimportant. In fact, part of the purpose and the reason Jesus has placed you in a family on this earth is because because Jesus wants you to influence them. Jesus wants you to share his love with them. Jesus wants you to be a light in that family and help lead your kids to Jesus and pray for your parents and be an example to them. In fact, it says in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 8, which is really interesting, the apostle Paul writes this. He says, if anyone does not provide for his relatives, especially for members of his own household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. So the scripture has a high view of family if you are a follower of Jesus. He says, if you're a follower of Jesus and, and you don't provide for the members of your own household, he's saying, you're worse than an unbeliever. Now in saying that, he does, he's not meaning, the context there isn't salvation. That doesn't mean you're not saved. He's saying, even unbelievers, even people who don't believe in Jesus, they take care of and nurture and cherish and provide for their family. So as followers of Jesus, how much more should we do that to prioritize the family and to take care of the family. So I did, I know that's a little side tangent here, but I, I've seen this passage abused and seen people try to justify neglecting the important ministry of family saying, oh, I'm just doing all this stuff for Jesus. I'm going on these missions trips for Jesus and I'm street evangelizing for Jesus and I'm doing all this stuff and their family relationships are falling apart. And if that's happening, then so, something's out of balance. We've, we, we've missed the heart of what Jesus is getting at here. So Jesus is not saying you should neglect your family once you come to me, you should completely forget about them. That's not what he's saying. What Jesus is saying in here in this passage, the whole entire purpose of this passage is Jesus is telling us that there is a family 
that is different than your biological family. It is a spiritual family. It is a family where the bonds go deeper than genetics. Again, Jesus here in this situation uses it to, to speak about the greatest family that we can be a part of. Again, his mother, Jesus' biological mom and brother show up and they're like, they're here. Your biological family is here. And Jesus uses this situation as an opportunity to invite people into his spiritual family, not his biological family. And the family that Jesus came to set up and establish, which what we're going to see here is so incredible, is a family from people of all different backgrounds, all different culture, all different sorts of people. Anybody can be adopted and brought into the family of God. So the whole point of this passage, it's talking about a family that is not a family just by birth, but a family by new birth. The family Jesus is talking about here is a family not just by blood, but a family that we're brought into by the blood of Jesus. Jesus here is inviting these people to become a part of the spiritual family that he came to establish and to set up on the earth. Now, when it comes to spiritual family, which is what Jesus is talking about here, the reality is this is something uh, initially that as we're born into, that at that moment, we don't have a choice. In the same way that you're, you have zero choice as to what biological family you're in. You had no choice who your mom was gonna be. You have no choice who your dad's gonna be. You had no choice who your brother and sister's gonna be, as much as we live in a, a culture that wants to try and control everything and think that we have control over everything, we actually have control over very little. So the family you were born into, you had no choice of that. In the same way, the spiritual family that we are born into is something that we had no control over. And sadly, the spiritual family that we're born into is a family that is alienated from God. It's a family that is not included in, that is not a part of the family of God. This is the family that we're all born into. We see a glimpse of this in Ephesians chapter two. If you wanna flip over there real quick, I want you to see this. This is the spiritual family, our spiritual condition that we had no choice of the moment that we were born on this earth. Here's what Paul says in Ephesians chapter two, starting in verse one. He says, and you were dead in trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, that is Satan, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. These are harsh words here, but what Paul is saying is the spiritual state and the spiritual family that we are born into is one that is controlled by the prince of the power of the air, that is Satan. He says the state that we are born in is we are sons of disobedience. The state that we're born into, he says, we are children of wrath like the rest of mankind. So what we have to get is that our spiritual state, our spiritual family that we're born into that we had no choice of is we are alienated from God. We are not a part of his spiritual family. We are by nature children of wrath, which is, I know, kind of freaky, but this makes it all the more beautiful what Jesus is doing here, opening up and explaining the beauty of being adopted into his family. John put it this way in 1 John 3, 10. Again, harsh language here, but this is what the scripture teaches. 1 John 3, 10, he says, by this it is evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. So the big idea here is that there are two spiritual families on this earth we are all a part of one of them. There are two spiritual kingdoms on this earth. We are all a part of one of them. There is, as scripture teaches, the children of God who are a part of the kingdom of light. And there are those who he says are, are children of Satan who are a part of the kingdom of darkness. And we are all a part of one of those families. Now here's the good news. Although we are born into the spiritual family that is alienated from God under the dominion of the prince of the power of 
of the air. The beautiful thing is this. God was not content to leave us in this spiritual condition. God was not content to leave us in this spiritual family. But before even the foundation of the world, God, knowing what was going to happen, beginning from end, God put a plan in motion to bring us into his family, to free us from the power of the prince of the air, to free us from the kingdom of darkness, and to make a way for us to be brought into his family. It says this in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 5 and 6, which is so beautiful. It says, he predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the beloved. This says before the foundation of the world, God already had a plan. God had chosen you to say, you know what? I'm going to bring you into my family. Although you're born spiritually dead, although we're born children of wrath, God, before you had any desire in your heart for him, he already loved you and he was already pursuing a relationship with you and he chose to adopt you and to bring you into his family. Adoption has nothing to do with me. It has nothing to do with you. A child looking for parents doesn't get to choose. I want you to adopt me. The parent says, I am choosing you. I'm bringing you into my family. And God has chosen to do that for all of his children. Paul says it this way in Colossians chapter one, verse 13 and 14, which is so beautiful. Paul says, check this out. He has delivered us from the dominion of darkness. That's the kingdom we were a part of and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption and the forgiveness of sins. Here's what he says here, two big things. He says that he has delivered us from the dominion of darkness and he has transferred us to the kingdom of light. He's delivered us and he's transferred us. The spiritual family that we were a part of is one in which we were in bondage. But when God delivered up his own son, Jesus, Jesus delivered us from that spiritual family. But he didn't just deliver us and free us from the kingdom of the prince of the power of the air. It says he also transferred us. He transferred us into the kingdom of light. He transferred us into his family. He transferred us to be a part of the plans that he has for our lives. He both delivered delivered us through what he did on the cross, and he transferred us to be a part of his family. And so this is the family that Jesus is talking about here. Jesus takes an opportunity when his biological family shows up Jesus says, this is actually an invitation for you guys to know that biology has nothing to do with your salvation. The biological family you're born into, there's something greater at work here. There's something greater at play here. Just because you grew up in a Christian home doesn't mean that you're a Christian, right? I love what Phil Comer says. He says that God has no grandchildren. He only has children. And at first I was like, what does that mean? And I kind of thought about it. And I was like, oh, in the same way that I, I have two sons now, Bear and Maverick, when they were born, my dad instantly became their grandparent. But God doesn't have any grandchildren, meaning when you who are following Jesus have a kid, God all of a sudden isn't magically already their their father because God has no grandchildren. Just because your parents are a part of the family of God, just because you grew up in a Christian household doesn't mean that you're automatically now in. Like you're automatically now good to go. You don't get a relationship with Jesus. You don't get into heaven because your mom or dad or grandma or grandpa had that. It's something that you have to choose. It's a decision that you have to make for yourself. And likewise, which is also really good news, Just because you grew up in a household biologically where your parents didn't know Jesus and where your parents didn't want anything to do with God, that doesn't mean that God wants nothing to do with you. Some people were blessed and privileged to grow up in a household with loving parents who taught them about Jesus. Some people had parents who wanted nothing to do with Jesus. But the amazing thing is that your spiritual adoption into the family of God, into the kingdom of light, it has nothing to do with your your parents. And whether your parents did follow Jesus or didn't follow Jesus, our adoption has nothing to do with biology. It has to do with what Jesus is doing in and through each single person. 
And this is a decision that every person has to make for themselves. God wants every single person to be brought into his family. When he looks out at the crowd here and says, who is my mother and my brothers? He looks out the crowd and says, you guys, you are whoever does the will of God. He says, he is my mother and he is my brother. And so the decision, again, has very little to do with your parents. It comes down to this. Do you want to do the will of God? Because that's what Jesus says in verse 35. He says, here's my mother and my brothers. Whoever does the will of God, he is my brother. He is my sister. He is my mother. Jesus says, it's anybody who wants to do the will of God. So again, Jesus is saying, my biological family is out there, but there's a spiritual family, and that is whoever does the will of God. So the, the question would be, well, what is that? If the way we get into the family of God is by doing the will of God, what does that look like? What are the steps? What's X, Y, and Z? What do I, what do I gotta do? Well, again, number one, he adopts us and, and he chooses us, which is foundational, but... The same question was asked in John chapter six. There was a crowd of people around Jesus in John six and they said, what do we have to do to do the works of God? What do we have to do to be a part of your family? What do we have to do to be saved? And Jesus boiled it down to this in John six, verse 29. He says this, this is the work of God. Here it is, that you believe in him whom he sent. What's God's will from you? What is the work that he wants from you? What does he want you to do? He says, this is it. This is the work of God that you believe in him, Jesus, whom he, the father sent. This is what God's will for your life is. God's will for you isn't that you go to church on Sunday mornings because you can go to church your entire life and never actually have a relationship with Jesus and never actually be a part of the family of God. God's will for your life is not just try and be a nice person as much as you can and just try to do good to everybody as much as you can because you can be the nicest person in the world and not actually be doing it for the right motives, the purpose of your heart, not be doing it for the kingdom. It could be coming from selfish motives. And so the will of God, what God wants for you, the work that God has for you is simply this, to believe in him who he has sent. And Jesus says, whoever does the will of God, this is my brother, this is my mother, this is my sister, whoever does the will of God. And that simply is this, to believe in Jesus whom the Father has sent. Because the moment that you do that, the moment you place your faith in Jesus, the moment you receive and believe the gospel that God sent his only son to this earth, Jesus, to die on our behalf on the cross, to take away our sin, which separated us from God. We were children of wrath, but now he's transferred us to the kingdom of light. The moment that you believe that what Jesus did for you on the cross is a reality and you accept it in your life and you accept his lordship in your life, you are adopted into the family of God. You are now transferred from the spiritual kingdom and the spiritual family of darkness to the family of God, the family that Jesus is talking about here, whereby now he can look out at you and look out at me and look out at us who was separated from God from the moment of birth and say, you are now my mother. You are now my father. You are now my brothers and my sisters. We are brought into the family of God by the will of God, which is simply to believe in the finished work of Jesus. And so this is something that the, 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 the call is extended to the crowds here. Jesus says, who is it? It's whoever does the will of God. And that same invitation that Jesus gave is, is available to us today. No doubt there were people there in the crowds who had never heard this concept, who thought family was only biological. And Jesus says, no, it's not just blood. It's, it's by my blood. It, it, it's something deeper. It's, it's faith in the finished work of Jesus. And so if you're here today and you're feeling like, man, I've never thought about that. I've, I've never had that. I never knew that God loved me so much that he wanted to bring me into his family and that he did all the work. He already 
finished it. There's nothing you have to do. There's no work for you other than you come and you, you trust in Jesus. And today, if you want that, if you want a relationship with Jesus, if you want access to the Father, and if you want to experience and walk and abide in his love, all you have to do is respond to that call. And the moment you place your faith in Jesus, you are transferred from the dominion of darkness into the family of light and into the kingdom of God, which is such a beautiful thing. My prayer here is that not a single person would leave here today without accepting this free gift to be brought into and adopted into the family of God. And if you have received that, if you already have been brought into the family of God, it goes a little bit further because Jesus having adopted us and brought us into the family of God has a plan for our life. He, he, he has something for us as we're brought into the family. And so for those of you guys who are like, yeah, like I have, I've placed my faith in Jesus. I'm now a part of the family of God. What does that mean? Like, how does that affect my life now? Having been adopted by the finished work of Jesus and brought into the family of God, should that like affect my life? And should, should things in my life look different and be different? What does it mean to actually be a part of the family of God? Well, what, I guess you have to get down to the root of what does it actually mean to be a part of any family? To be in a family, what, what does that actually mean? And I think if we can solve that a little bit, it'll help us see what it means to be brought into the family of God. And one way that I like to answer this question is by looking at the difference between the experience you have when you go to a restaurant versus a family dinner. So please follow me on this journey for a moment here as we, as we examine what is the difference between going to a restaurant and a family dinner? Well, as you know, if you do go to a restaurant, which I highly recommend, lots of amazing restaurants have been here. Shout out to my boy, Ricky over there. Love Brick Room. It's my go-to. Just saying, shout out. Uh, so when you go to a restaurant, what's the experience? Well, they, they, they walk you over the table. It's already set for you. They take your order for you. They're like, hey, what do you want to drink? Oh, cool. You need some refills. Good to go. They clear the table for you. They take it all away. They wipe it down. They do the dishes. They come out and they're like, you want dessert? And you're like, yeah, Ricky, I want that crisp pear with ice cream or maybe an affogato, right? Like that, if you haven't had that at Brick Room, please. Like your life is not complete yet. So like, please just, just go and have it, okay? So the, when you go to a restaurant, they're just serving you. They're just doing everything for you. And the craziest thing is you can even complain about everything in a restaurant and they'll keep serving you. You can be like, eh, the burger was undercooked. Can I get a new one? And they're like, yeah, totally. And eh, the fries were a little too crispy. Can I get, yeah, totally. Uh, there's too much ice in my drink and it's all watery now. Can I get a new one? Yeah, totally. They just keep serving you over and over and over again. Now, let me just say this. If you do that to your mom at your family dinner, your dad is going to do something to you. And it's not going to be good, right? Like literally, think about that. Try, try how you do stuff at a restaurant at a family dinner table. You're like, mom, cheesecake, I'm ready. I'll take a cheesecake. She's like, no, you're going to take the trash out and do dishes. And now you're grounded for a week, right? The way that we function at a family dinner is completely different from a restaurant. The difference is in a restaurant, they are there to serve you. They do everything for you. Whereas in a family, hopefully, hopefully every single person in that family is contributing in some way. It's not just they're doing everything for you. They're bringing you dishes. They're bringing you a drink. They're refilling it. it it's everybody participates in some way. And so to be a part of a family means that you do something actually, that you have some sort of role, that you have some sort of responsibility. And the same is true spiritually when we are adopted into the family of God, that's not the end all be all, that's the beginning of the journey. But God adopts us into his family, check this out, to actually do something. He doesn't adopt you and bring you into his family for you to now just be on cruise control and do nothing for the rest of your life. Jesus didn't bring you into his family so that everybody around you can now serve you and do everything for you. He brought you into his family so that you can be a part of a family, so that you can serve other people so that you can love other people, so that you can meet the needs of other people. And as you grow and mature in the family of God, 
The hope is that you will grow as well and mature as well in your family dynamics and you will understand, wow, I have more responsibility than now I can take on. I have a growing desire to contribute more. And again, that's a process and that's a journey. And when people are just starting that journey in the family of God, we don't have the expectation up here, right? I've got two sons, Bear and Maverick. Maverick is six months old. I don't expect him to do anything. He's still 100% a part of my family, but guess what? He ain't contributing nothing right now. Just poopy diapers and waking me up in the middle of the night. It's no contribution from him. Bear is almost two and a half, and now the bar's been raised a little bit. I'm like, Bear? You just dump that out, go get a rag and wipe it up. And he figures it out. He's like, ooh, and he runs around and he'll grab it. And I'm like, thank you. But there's still certain things I don't expect Bear to do. I don't expect him to do his laundry. I don't expect him to do dishes. He hasn't figured that out yet, but it, it, it grows, right? As they grow and as they mature, they take on more responsibility in the family. That's the way that it should be in the spiritual family of God that we are adopted into. But the problem is, so many Christians, I've seen this so much, they've been adopted into the family of God. You're like, yes, Jesus, yes, the cross, yes, the gospel, I've trusted it all, I'm in, I'm a part of the family, but they have remained in a stage of spiritual infancy having been brought into that family. They haven't yet found their roles and responsibility, and yet even worse, maybe they don't want it. They just want like the free, got the ticket checked, I'm going to heaven, I'm good, and now I can just be on cruise control. They've been adopted into the family, but they think that that's the end all be all. They think that it just stops there. And God is saying no, to be brought into the family means you, you do something, you contribute something, that every single person in the body, every single person in the family has different gifts, has different abilities, has different callings on their lives, has different talents that they can bring to the table so that the entire entire family can continue to grow. And here's what I'll tell you. Although you are a part of the family of God, if you've placed your faith in Jesus, the church will never feel like a family until you take responsibility and until you take ownership. And this is what I've seen so much. Some people in church their whole life complaining about everything, oh, this and this and this, and, and they've never contributed a single thing. The people who complain the most are the people who give the most every single time. And that's why we don't let the complainers dictate the vision of where we're going and the direction of where God's calling us. If you wanna speak into something, contribute to it. If you wanna change something, serve and start changing it. Start loving people. Take on that responsibility. Jesus said, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And the problem is, a lot of people have been brought into the family of God, but they haven't actually treasured it. And so their heart is disconnected. They're like, man, I feel like I'm part of the family, right? Like I'm supposed to be, but I don't feel like it. I, I come into church and I don't feel those connections. I feel so disconnected. It could be that you're not actually doing anything that you're just continuing to come and consume and consume and consume. And that is okay at, for a season of life. If you're new to this whole thing, we have zero expectation of you at all. I want you to grow. We're here to serve you. We're here to love you. We want you to be fed. But hopefully that's not a 20 year process where you say, I've given my life to Jesus and now I'm still just having you baby feed me. Hopefully there comes a point where you say, I'm ready to serve. I'm ready to take some responsibility. I'm ready to contribute and to give and to connect and love. And until you do that, your heart will always feel disconnected from the family. And so my challenge and my encouragement is, A, for those who have not been brought into the family of God, again, today Jesus gives that call. He says, here they are. Here's my family. Whoever does the will of the Father, and the will of the Father is that you would believe in the Son that you place your faith in the finished work of Jesus, the moment that happens, you're adopted into the family of God. And for those of you who have received that, and you've said, yes, my faith is in Jesus, the question I have for you is, for you to just search your heart, and for you to ask and say, how am I contributing to the family of God? How can I love 
How can I serve? How can I connect? How can I be generous with my time, with my resources, with my relationships? Where is God calling you to take responsibility? Where is God calling you to take ownership of the family? Because until you do that, you're always gonna feel on the outskirts. You're always gonna feel disconnected. But what God wants for us as a family is depth. He doesn't want shallow relationships. He wants depth. And that's what we're ultimately longing for as a family. That's what we want. We want to know and be known. We want to know people and be known by people. And we have an opportunity to do that every single week as we gather as as a family. We have an opportunity to love each other. We have an opportunity to serve each other. We have an opportunity to give. If you're in a conversation with someone and they're in a difficult spot and you have the ability to meet that need, don't call the church and say, hey, this person needs this. Can the church buy that? If you have the ability, that, that's your family. Give to them, help them, love them, serve them. And so the question for those who are a part of the family is simply this, where is God calling you to take on more responsibility? Where is God calling you to serve? Where is God calling you to give? How is God calling you to take ownership of this family? And I wanna just really challenge you guys in that, that this week, whatever it is God puts on your heart, there is unlimited opportunities here. If there's things God puts on your heart that we don't have, maybe it's because he's wanting you to start that. Like Joe and and Loomis were like, man, there's no like evangelism and outreach. And they said, we're not gonna wait for the church to do that. We feel called to that. We're gonna go and start doing street ministry. Man, we want another small group and a home group. Nobody has one. Start one. If God puts that on your heart, oh man, our kids kind of the, the craft and maybe go serve and help with the craft if you're creative and whatever it is. How is God calling you to take responsibility and ownership for this family? And when you say yes to that, and when each one of us is doing our part and fulfilling our role, guess what? The family thrives. Guess what? The family grows. Guess what? People who aren't a part of the family who don't know Jesus come in and see what a real spiritual family looks like and they say, wow. I want that. I've been looking for that in the world, but the world doesn't have that. It's only found in the body of Christ. So my challenge and exhortation for us is that we would be the family of God. We say yes to Jesus. That's the will of the Father. And then we ask now, as a part of your family, having been adopted in, what do you have for me, Jesus? How can I love, serve, give, and contribute? Amen? Amen.